is Herbert Mullen. Yeah, her, we actually called him Herbie, and I knew him for uh, close to six years when I was at uh, CMC. And uh, the thing about Herbie was that um, when <laughs> I saw him as an odd character, but I didn't see him as anything overtly, you know, that set me off to go, hmm, he's, I, I should stay away from him or anything like that. Uh, my, my actual first con, my first conversation with him was uh, at CMC at that time, we could be out on the yard till 10 to 10 at night before he had come in lock up. And uh, I was coming back from um, the hobby shop about 930. And as I came onto the yard, I see Herbie and I knew who knew his name and stuff. And he was kind of doing this like little, what I would refer to as like a little rain type dance, you know, looking up the stars and stuff like that. And he had these big headphones on and he sees me and he goes, Hey, Hey, come here, come here. So I come over and he hands me the headphones. He goes, listen to this. So I'm assuming he's got a cassette player in his pocket and he's playing some cassette and stuff. So I put the headphones on and I'm listening and I'm listening and I'm listening and, and there's nothing. I hear him, not a sound. And, and I look down and he's holding the cord with the plug in, in his hand. And I go, what am I supposed to be hearing, Herbie? He goes, sounds of the universe. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and, and I went, yeah, yeah. Okay, Herb. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And I gave him his headphones back and I walked away and I went back and I told my Sally and my Sally said, you don't know who Herbie is, do you? And I said, no. He says, well, Herbie is who we commonly refer to as the earthquake killer. And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah. He goes, that uh, in 1972, Herbie started going on this murder spree because Herbie's birth date was the same date that the 1906 San Francisco earthquake had happened. Mm. And he was concerned that because Vietnam was starting to wind down, that there wasn't going to be any blood to um, basically quell the, the earth's desire to cause another massive earthquake for California. He felt that after 906, that the First World War, the Americans gave so much blood in that war. And then you had the Second World War. And then you had Korea. And then you had Vietnam. So he felt that was why the big earthquake hadn't happened. But now he was hearing voices that were telling him from an angelic point of view that if you kill people, you can prevent the earthquake from happening. Now, you have to, people may think that's really strange and bizarre but you have to remember in the late 60s there was such a big belief that there was going to be a massive earthquake and it was going to go down the san andreas fault that a big section of california would actually slide off into the pacific ocean and so suddenly san francisco would not be a bay it'd be underwater but fresno would suddenly become a major port you know and bakersfield would become a major port all these inland places in the inland valley and people who were well to do well-educated uh, business people were actually buying farmland in the middle of this you know, area with the hopes of becoming multi-billionaires when the earthquake happened and they helped build the next port. So it wasn't really that far out for people to think this might happen. But so he gets told you know, about this. Now, Herbie ended up killing 10 people. Okay. What would you know the nature of his victims? Were they? Well, his 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 very first nat first one he killed was uh, a homeless person who had been hitchhiking, and he somehow convinced the guy to look in his, under the engine bonnet uh, about something, and he beat the guy to death with a bat. But what he said was that he mentally heard the guy tell him, "I am your Jonah. You need to throw me out of the boat because I have to be sacrificed so others could live." So he just complied with what the guy's mind told him to do. Was he on drugs? Well, here's the thing. Uh, he had tattooed on his arm, LSD is God. And Herbie had told me at one time that he believed, because he didn't keep an accurate count, but he said he probably did about a thousand hits of acid, you know, in about a five-year period of time. Um, But the thing is that Herbie was another one of those guys whose IQ tested way above the scales he goes um that uh he just believed in things that other people
couldn't even possibly conceive. Um, he actually could draw, he could actually draw back uh, star maps from like you tell him 10 years ago, what would the stars over you know, London looked like 10 years ago. Yeah. And he would look at a map of the stars of London today mm -hmm. and his mind allowed him to go back and redraw the map, what it would have been 10 years ago. And he could do this. And the other talent that he had uh, was that he would pick up a dictionary of language. He would read through this dictionary. Then he'd come to somebody who spoke the language, start talking to them, learning some of the basic things and within a couple of months he could walk up and start carrying on a conversation in that language Good grief now he wasn't necessarily fluent but he could still carry on conversations and so he actually had done this with a number of languages while i was there you know and we had a lot of language courses available plus we had a lot of people from a lot of uh different countries so and that used to spook people too because of how he could just do this he, 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 had, he had an ability to pick up languages to a point where he could actually be conversational with people but he he never became fluent in really any language that i know of but like because he knew i could speak some gaelic he went and learned gaelic and come up one day and just broke into a, a couple of sentences so well that it took me off and i actually had to go ask him to repeat it because i didn't know what he said because i was last last thing i was expecting is to have somebody come up and be able to talk to me like that. But he did that to a few Korean guys. He did it to some of the Jewish guys who spoke Yiddish. <laughs> and he even did it to a Russian guy. And so it was like, you know, you know, they they just, they thought, oh, you must have learned it as a child. No, I just had to pick out the book and looked at it. Um, Do you know what happened to his other victim? Okay, so his, sec so second, one. Yeah, his second victim was a priest. <clears throat> and uh, the priest was doing confession. He went in to do a confession. There was actually a few people in the chow in the church, you know, praying and or maybe waiting for confession and stuff. And he went in and he suddenly believed that the priest was actually, you know, uh, out to, to cause him harm. And, uh, and that the priest said, kill me as an ultimate sacrifice because I'm a priest and I'm a thing of God and I'm ready to meet my, my Lord. And, um, so, so he did, he, he killed the guy. Wow. Blood was coming out of the, the confessional by the time he got through. Um, and there were people that saw him, but all they could describe was a manic man dressed in black running away. And the funny part or not funny part, but the kind of strange part about it was the priest was actually had been, uh, uh, person who had been French partisan during World War II. And he had survived that and to die this way. Oh dear. Um, then um, he then picked up a female hitchhiker. And ironically, the hitchhiker he picked up could have been picked up by Kemper as well because it was about the same time period. Oh my goodness. But he picked her up and then he killed her and, and dismembered her body across a, a roadway area. But he said that that actually kind of sickened him. So he didn't want to continue doing things like that. But again, it was somebody he felt that had, had, had mentally told him to please sacrifice me. Now, his next four victims were all killed at the same time. And he basically, he had a real thing about nature. And he didn't like people polluting nature or, or uh, littering nature and stuff. And he was somewhere where he came across four young teenage boys and they were somewhat camping out. And uh, he thought that they were not treating nature properly. So he actually told them he was a park ranger and told them they had to leave. And um, one of the boys had a 22 caliber rifle and apparently it pointed it at him, not believing he was a park ranger. So Herbie left. Herbie came back the next day and he killed all four of them with a gun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he just left them out there and they were, they were, you know, weren't found for about a week. At some point in time, he finally decided he needed to stop using drugs. And then he started thinking back about why he started using drugs. And he remembered the friend that first gave him marijuana. So he decided he was going to go and kill his friend because he had to kill his friend. So 
that would break the fact, the cycle that he'd started drugs. So now he would never have done drugs. So now he wouldn't do drugs. You got to understand Herbie's mind. So <laughs> Herbie ended up uh, going to the house where his friend had lived. Problem was his friend didn't live there anymore. But the girl who did live there knew his friend said, oh, no, no. He lives over here with his wife. Gives him the address. So Herbie drove over there and uh, Herbie killed his friend and killed his friend's wife. And then decided to go back and kill the girl who gave the address to him. And um, that accounted for his, his 10 his ten killings. Um, Herbie had done his killings after the death penalty had been uh, stricken in 72. So he wasn't a part of the class of 72 who got released off death row. So the thing was, um, he actually helped defend himself. And his his defense in court was, I killed these people because I was told if I did this, the earthquake wouldn't happen. And as you see, the earthquake didn't happen. So, which is in, if in, in, a, in an odd way, you know, gave him the fact that they couldn't prove that if he hadn't killed these people, that the earthquake wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And uh, the fact that he kept saying this came from an angelic or God type being he also used the fact that did not God speak to people in the past to tell them to do things that were not necessarily socially acceptable? How do you know God didn't talk to me? And so a person who actually, quote, is a Christian might have a certain amount of a problem because they don't want to say God doesn't talk to people because people are all the time saying that God intervenes in their lives. But of course, they don't want to say that he did in this stick, in this case, because then that adds even more of a uh, kind of a problem to the situation. So Herbie got convicted of two first degree murders. Now at the time he got convicted, first degree murder only carried seven years to life. And then he got eight second degrees. And um, at that time, uh, the, the second degrees uh, were not necessarily life sentences, but they would give you like up to 10 years for each of them, stuff like that. Um, now, Herbie has has uh, always had a real problem with boards and stuff because he doesn't recognize their authority. Um, and his whole thing was he absolutely does believe that he did what he did to save California and that even though people may not have liked it, they should have at least, you know, basically went... Well, thanks. You know, at least you did do something good, even though you did it in a bad way. Um, Herbie and I spoke, like I said, probably I would say at least daily, if not two or three times a day. He used to come by the weight pile. Uh, he would tell me uh, how much weight I needed to add or take off to get this definition of this muscle or that because he read it somewhere. And he had one of those minds that once he read something, it just seemed to lock in forever. And uh, the thing was that he was he was always very cordial. He was, and actually in a lot of ways, I found him to be quite humble in a lot of ways. He did not um, uh, have any um, way where he tried to be bigger or more or anything else than he, what you might think of him at the, as you saw him. Now he was at Vacaville with Kemper and Kemper regularly tried to uh, intimidate him because Kemper didn't like his crimes. Kemper thought his crimes were disgusting. How do I? Yeah. So, so there was, there was that. And, and, and Herbie had actually talked to me about that. He was really grateful when he got to come down to CMC to get away from uh, Kemper because of the fact that he ultimately felt there would come a day where one or the other would probably be dead. And uh, he did not actually feel that he would have come out well on that thing because of Kemper's size. Yeah. But uh, the thing was, but yeah, Kemper actually berated him about what a, a sick person he was and what a, a horrible killer he was. And like I say, but when you look at Kemper's crimes, you go, really? You know? And of course, people don't realize that, that there's been a lot of books written about Kemper and a lot of uh, TV series have had characters based on him. But he was also the, uh, the, the inspiration for the Buffalo Bill character in Silence of the Lamb. So that's how influential in society that Edwin Kemper has been. And Edmund Kemper usually was known as Big Ed because of his size. Um, 
But Herbie Mullen, the only time I ever got kind of spooked about Herbie was Herbie kept talking about that the day when he got out, he wanted to travel the world and visit lots of places. And when he said, oh, I understand that you're from the, from the Isle of Man. He goes, I've looked up your Isle. I want to come visit you. And I said, there's actually nothing there. There's no reason to come visit my little country. Um, you know, maybe you should go like, you know, to Russia or someplace like that. Uh, because the last thing I want to do be the guy that he got somehow did get out, came over there, did things and said, well, it's because, you know, Jamie told me about this place. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want any responsibilities behind that. Uh, but, uh, Herbie, uh, is, um, unlikely to ever see the streets because Herbie cannot pass psychic evaluations. And, um, he usually gets multiple year denials. Um, so are these guys in like supermax for the rest of their lives? Or no, they, no. Do they work their way down? No, they're, he's not in a supermax. He's he's actually in basically a medium security prison. Okay. And Kemper is actually, Vacaville is kind of funny because it's a medical facility predominantly, mm -hmm. but it no longer does the reception like it did back then. When it was reception, it had a higher level of security because they hadn't classified and you had everybody from petty thieves to mass murderers going in there. Now it's considered a medium security. So they're both in medium security prisons. It's very unlikely they'll ever go any lower than that, but they're they're in a medium security prison, what we call level three, or over here uh, be a category B prison in the UK. So that's where that's where those two are. And what about prisoners trying to like just kill these guys to make names for themselves or because some of the victims were female, young women, college uh, students, do, do prisoners ever try and try and kill these guys well, as well? That is another one of those things that's that's always kind of interesting. And then this is part of what the thing about with the like we were going to go into later with the, some of the gangs and stuff is that the the fact that all their victim, his victims and and Kemper's were basically white. None of the other races care less. They, they don't care. You know, it's white people killing white people. Uh, the white races generally the thing is that those. Even the AB that were at CMF were actually kind of not too sure about wanting to go after Kemper because of how big he was and the fact that he doesn't have an ounce of, you know, compassional humanity towards living people, people who are dying. He doesn't seem to have a problem with, you know. But if you're dead or if you're alive, he's kind of like doesn't care. So if you're in that process, he seems to care a little more. Herbie, the thing was with Herbie is that most people just thought he was just kind of odd and that because he used so many drugs and stuff, he he wasn't seen as being somebody who anybody would care if you did kill him. It's not like you're going to get, it's not like if you went after uh, some other people that might have uh, where you pick up a reputation, you know, like Tex Watson, there were a few attempts on Tex Watson.